Good morning, I'm Tamara Shoemaker. So when my husband and I lived in Ireland, we had the chance to take a short vacation down in Italy, Italy with my parents um, who had been missionaries in Italy many years before that, um, but they could still speak the language fairly well. And so when they flew over to join us, they kind of acted a little bit as translators for us in case we needed it for different places. Um, so we had the chance to visit several places within uh, Italy. We got to go to Venice and Florence and uh, Sicily where my parents had based their missionary work and then up in Rome again, where we ended our time. So when we visited Rome, we walked around the Roman Forum with one of my parents' friends um, who was a pastor who lived in the city and he was kind enough to give us a more formal uh, tour. And I soon realized that he was as, at least as much of a history buff as I was, because he gave so many details about the various structures we saw and I would dutifully raise my camera and take like 40 pictures of everything. So um, it's funny, I went back to look over my Italy pictures not too long ago and I have a whole slew of pictures of this single cobblestone. And it took me a minute to kind of remember why I had taken so many pictures of a rock. But one of the things our pastor friend had mentioned when we were there was that these cobblestones were the same ones that had been in existence uh, in Nero's Rome, and that the nearly unnoticeable weathered grooves in the cobblestones were evidence of chariot wheels, which completely blew my mind. And I think I probably took 80 pictures of different, you know, cobblestones. But can you blame me, really? I mean, okay, I'll release my inner nerd for a second. When we think of old in the United States, um, we might think of like colonial America, right? The Liberty Bell, the Midnight Paul, Ride of Paul Revere, right? But it was a whole different experience walking through the ruins of ancient Rome and realizing Paul the Apostle was likely to have been imprisoned in the very prison that we were able to take a tour of. Or, you know, so many chariot wheels rode up the hill through the Arch of Titus that they left grooves that are visible over 2,000 years later. That was just so cool. <laughs> Anyway, so speaking of the Arch of Titus um, among the ruins, on the interior wall of the Arch of Titus, there was an old, old engraving, and I have a picture of it on my blog. You can go to my blog and see it there. Um, our pastor friend pointed it out, and he said, do you recognize that? And I walked closer, and it was the scene of victory, right? Many men carrying spoils of conquest over their heads. And two things were immediately recognizable to me. There was a really large menorah, one of those big candlesticks that you think of um, when you think of like Hanukkah and so forth. And then the edgings of the outlines of a, of a rectangular shaped box. They weren't really crisp anymore, but they were still recognizable. Um, the whole sculpture was the artist's depiction of the Babylonians carrying the, the temple's articles at the fall of Jerusalem. And the box itself was the Ark of the Covenant. So back to Joshua. I got so excited about that arch again, I kind of forgot where I was going. So I'm, I'm on it now. All right. So in Joshua 18, we're still dividing up the land, right? Judah's gotten their allotment. Joseph um, has gotten their allotment. They're split between um, Ephraim and Manasseh. Um, we didn't spend a lot of time on the two and a half tribes that received theirs east of the Jordan because that happened in Moses's time before the book of Joshua really started. But there are still seven tribes that need to apportion their land. There's Benjamin, uh, Simeon, Zebulun, Issachar, Asher, Naphtali, and Dan. And Joshua is going to get his own apportionment too, like Caleb got his, but we'll get to that later. So anyway, Joshua 18 details Benjamin's apportionment, which with lots of descriptions of landforms and cities as boundaries is about as interesting as you might suspect. But in chapter 18, verse 1, I got derailed like right away. The verse says, the whole assembly of the Israelites gathered at Shiloh and set up the tent of meeting there. So first things first, y'all know I'm big on name meanings, right? I think there's a lot of power in the spoken word. James spends a lot of time in his book, uh, in one of his chapters, on that same concept. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. So... James sets up a vivid metaphor for us about how an entire forest can be set on fire by a single spark, how a huge animal like a horse can be turned with a tiny bit in its mouth, or how an enormous ship can be turned by a single rudder, right? So words have power. That's why when my husband and I named our kids, we had to love the meanings of their names as much as we loved the names themselves. My oldest daughter's name means living water flowing down. 
So I pray, may she be a bringer of the living water that Jesus gives. My son's name means mountain of strength, and Yahweh is God. May he be an unshakable, immobile source of strength as he declares Yahweh is God. And my youngest daughter's name means clear, unfettered, pure light. May she bring the unmitigated, unshaded light of Jesus into people's lives. So those are my prayers for my kids, and that's why we named our kids those names. So with that said, I've always loved the name Shiloh. Shiloh means peace, tranquility. And you know, what a great place to convene for the Israelites, right? Decide their futures, the lands that they're going to settle in and have their kids in and their grandkids and to lay out their inheritances and to move on from their fraught pasts, right? So you'd think. Unfortunately, simply because a name is spoken over a place or over a person, it doesn't always mean that it's going to come to pass just like it's spoken, right? While I pray over my kids every single day and while I bring their name meetings before the Lord and ask him to intervene in their lives so that they will they, they themselves will reflect those meanings, they have the choice, right? They have the willpower to reject or accept as they so choose. That's a, That's on them. So the Israelites, they so choose. As history and scripture show, they move away from the God of Israel over the course of time. And we'll get there later. <laughs> so the Battle of Shiloh in the Civil War was one of the bloodiest battles on the early end of the war. Nearly twice as many men died in that battle than in all the previous battles combined in the war up to that point. There wasn't much peaceful about that name. Um, in the biblical Shiloh, the whole assembly of the Israelites gathered up, at, gathered at Shiloh, set up the tent of meeting there. So, as I said, what a great place to set up, right? This is the place where they're putting the Ark of the Covenant. They put set up the tent of meeting. The Ark of the Covenant is going inside that tent of meeting. It's now the resting place of the Lord, the physical symbol of his throne between the cherubim at a place called peace. So, let's take a quickish trip <laughs> through the upcoming years. The Israelites set up the tent of meeting in Shiloh because Jerusalem as yet is not the capital, and Zion as yet has not been taken uh, from the Jebusites who lived there. Um, if you remember my post, house cleaning, give no quarter from a few days ago, I talked about that. So Shiloh became the center of Israel, where the Lord dwelled in his tabernacle. Years pass. Eventually, Joshua dies, and we go through the whole dark, dark book of Judges when it says, in those days, Israel had no king. All the people did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. That's Joshua, uh, sorry, Judges chapter 21, verse 25. Distance, right? People forgot that the Lord had delivered them from their enemies when they served him. Priests became figureheads, right? Eli, the high priest, grew fat from excessive food and couldn't control his sons. Then came the Philistines, enemies of Israel. So in 1 Samuel chapter 4, they attack, the Philistines attack Israel, and there's all sorts of fighting over the course of this battle. 4,000 people, soldiers of Israel, they died in the, that battle on the, on the first day. So they pull back and they lick their wounds, right? And as they do so, the elders of Israel have this brilliant light bulb moment. What moment? They say, why did the Lord bring defeat upon us today before the Philistines? Let's bring the Ark of the Lord's Covenant from Shiloh so that it may go with us and save the hand, save us from the hand of our enemies. That's 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse 3. So let's study this brilliant, epic moment of flawed logic, right? It doesn't matter that we've largely forgotten that we are a chosen people, a royal nation, a people belonging to God. Right? I know that's from 1 Peter 2, verse 9, and addresses both Jews and Gentiles. But we've got the Ark of the Covenant. This is what the Israelites are saying. We've got a good luck charm. We can force a victory from God, even though we've shut him out in the cold. Land sakes. <laughs> is any of this recognizable? Lord, we're in trouble. We've got a global pandemic, and we've got politicized mask debates, and there's rioting over all these issues, and there's trouble, and there's heartbreak, and there's confusion, and people are dying, and China's scary, and Russia is being Russia, and Israel and Hamas are at it again, and, 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 but don't you dare mention that the word of God is true or right, right? Don't you dare suggest that we humble ourselves and pray and seek his face so that we, so that he will hear from heaven and forgive our sins and heal our land, Right? Instead, let's pray for good luck prayers and send thoughts and good vibes. Whew. So what happens in 1 Samuel? 
So the people sent men to Shiloh, the place of peace, and they brought back the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim. And Eli, he was the high priest of Israel, Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. And that's from 1 Samuel 4. 4. The Israelites get their religious leader's blessing over their unholy enterprise, despite the fact that these particular religious leaders don't give glory and honor to God. Uh, 1 Samuel 2 verse 12 says Eli's sons were scoundrels. They had no regard for the Lord. They're priests, but they're scoundrels. <laughs> and they run back to the Philistines, waving their good luck charm in their face. They've got the Ark of the Covenant. The Lord's going to win for them. doesn't matter that they've forgotten him. So what happens? The Philistines fought, and the Israelite, Israelites were defeated, and every man fled to his tent. The slaughter was very great. Israel lost 30,000 foot soldiers. The Ark of God was captured, and Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, died. That's 1 Samuel 4, 10 and 11. The Ark of God was captured. The place of peace was no longer a place of peace, right? It had lost the symbol of who had first brought the peace of Israel in the Old Covenant, long before the New Covenant ever fulfilled the Old Covenant. And here's my thought. I'm so glad that God's symbolic, earthly, man-made, quote, throne is not equal to God himself. If it were, what a tragic day when the Philistines captured the Ark, right? If it were, what a tragic time when the Babylonians destroy Solomon's temple in Jerusalem and carry off the spoils of war later depicted on the Arch of Titus. Jeremiah chapter 3 verses 16 and 17 says, In those days, the messianic days, the last days, the ones that I believe we are now living in, in those days when your numbers have increased greatly in the land, declares the Lord, men will no longer say the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. It will never enter their minds or be remembered. It will not be missed, nor will another one be made. At that time, they will call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord, and all nations will gather in Jerusalem to honor the name of the Lord. Jerusalem is a place that I've always wanted to visit, right? But And, you know, how amazing will it be when it becomes the throne of the Lord, when all nations gather there to honor the name of the Lord? I don't know the layout of, you know, end time events specifically, but I do know that they're coming. I don't know if it'll happen tomorrow or in a thousand years, but I've got the confidence that I will see the Lord with my own eyes. Job chapter 19, verse 25 to 27 says, I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand on the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh, I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I and not another how my heart yearns within me. So hear Job's prophetic words of faith. Let them resound in your own heart. I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I and not another, how my heart yearns within me. See, it doesn't really matter where the symbolic throne of God's presence ended up, right? It will not be missed, says the Lord, because it's not his actual throne. You want a description of his actual throne? Here it is, and buckle up. Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 22 and 26 to 28 says, Spread out above the heads of the living creatures was what looked like an expanse, sparkling like ice and awesome. Above the expanse over their heads was what looked like a throne of sapphire, and high above on the throne was a figure like that of a man. I saw that from what appeared to be his waist up, he looked like glowing metal, as if full of fire, and that from there down he looked like fire and brilliant light surrounded him. Like the appearance of a rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day, so was the radiance around him. Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 and 10 says, As I looked, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow, and the hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated, and the books were opened. And then Revelation chapter 4, verses 2 and 3 says, and chapter and verse 6 says, At once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian. A rainbow resembling an emerald encircled the throne, 
and also before the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. Now someday every single one of us, those who claim to have a relationship with the one who sits on the throne, and those who have spent a lifetime denying his existence, we're all going to stand there by that crystal sea, by that river of fire. I say stand, I'm pretty sure we'll be on our faces, but he's going to demand an accounting from us. And let me tell you what he's not. He's not a good luck symbol. He's not the crucifix you keep on your mantelpiece. He's not the cross necklace you wear around your neck, right? He's not the good deeds that you do or the causes that you take up. Maybe some of those things are evidences of his presence and his work in you, but he's not those things themselves. He is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of all Lords, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end, the Lamb who was slain and the Prince of Peace. Are you ready for Shiloh? Are you ready for the Prince of Peace? And if not, make sure that you get there. <laughs> Message me, call me, whatever. I'm here. Or find somebody that you trust, that you're able to talk to. And that's what I had for today. I will see you tomorrow. <laughs>